Lebron Adam's life, you don't see that in many people. Uh, we came to Kenya last year in the uh, last part of August. It's not even a year ago. And we came to a brother called Brother Gasper Aswen. I hope that you someday will remember his name and keep praying for him. Because he have, in a way, a ministry that can resemble the gift that was operating in Brother Branham. Maybe not to the same extent, but he saw people that uh, had problems. And there were people that never had been in church before because there were so many uh, healings going on in that church. Therefore, people came from far away in Kenya, just popped up in that church and sit there, and they never knew what was going to happen. And then the brother could look. <coughs> I hope I don't scare people. <laughs> Because uh, I got this mic here. <laughs> you are safe, right? <laughs> and I saw him because I was standing beside the brother. And he said, you brother. And he was sitting on that side. And he said, brother, you are planning to commit suicide. Is that right? And the brother, oh my. <laughs> but he had to admit, yes, that's true. And it's all because of money. You lost so much money that you think that life is not worth living anymore. But he said, don't commit suicide. Your money will be restored very shortly. Don't worry about it. And he just left him like that. Didn't say any more. And there were other people. But a few days later, the same brother popped up in church again. No, he was kind of excited. And he came up and he showed a piece of paper that was officially stamped. And he said the, the, the name of the brother, his address, and the money that was taken away from him will be fully restored, so don't worry. So it was an official document that the money would be returned. And of course, the brother was very happy. Well, I think he was glad he didn't commit suicide. <laughs> <coughs> so incidences like that, that doesn't happen every day. And it doesn't happen to every person either. But uh, I have heard, uh, I don't know if I can say this, Amber. <laughs> can I say it? All right. Amber, she didn't like me, right? Not because of who I am, but every time she came to church, she was exposed. She came for prayer. And everything that she had on her mind was revealed to her. Hey, I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you're here today. That's a reason. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, sometimes we never know what we're telling people. When we pray for people, we, we actually don't know, but sometimes the Lord even speaks. Uh, it was a few years back here in Bloomington during one of the services, and there was a brother called Matthew Cox, and he was sitting back there with his son, and he came up for prayer because he had a big problem, and he was so sick, he said. And uh, when I went down to pray, uh, of course, the brother said, Brother Swami, you go down and pray for him. But the music here was so loud that you couldn't really talk to anyone. So therefore, 
I didn't get the chance to speak to him because everybody was singing and shouting and, and going on. But, but the Lord said, tell him he is not sick. And hey, to tell a brother that I've been to every doctor in town and tell him that he's not sick, that's a very big challenge, right? If I tell you you don't have cancer and you do have cancer, right, and you relax and then you die and you die of cancer, that is a very serious matter. So therefore, you don't speak about anyone or anything. You just pray for people. If you don't see anything, leave it alone. But I prayed for him <clears throat> and I couldn't talk. So therefore, he went back to his seat. And then I came up to the front and I preached a message. And I was thinking about the brother sitting there, but I didn't want to approach him from the pulpit. So therefore, I preached my message, said amen, and went and sit back in my seat. But then he had a son, and his son, son started tugging him, said, Dad, I feel sick. I need to go up to that man to pray, to be prayed for. And he needed daddy to come with him. So I saw the little boy come dragging with the father because I prayed, Lord, can you please give me another chance to talk to him? And when I saw the little boy came tugging with him, I said, my Lord, you are remarkable. There's no one like you. And he came up to the front and he said, well, it is not me this time, it is my son. I said, well, that's what you think. <laughs> <coughs> but of course, I prayed for the son. And then after I prayed for the son, I just took his hand, I grabbed his shoulders, and I said, but the message is for you. You have been to many doctors. You have tried to find out about your problem so many times. But there's a message from the Lord to you. You are not sick. And the brother, he jumped out of my arms and started running around here like crazy. Or should I say, like happy. That was on a Wednesday night. His wife was with him. And on Thursday, they had an appointment with the doctor again. <laughs> That's very strange. And they went into the doctor's office. And the wife said he had a lot of papers, documents, and journals of the brother. And the doctor sat down, and they were sitting in front of him. And he said, I have now studied everything about you, up and down, in and out. And there's only one solution that I can come up with. You are not sick. Hallelujah. That brother went out of the doctor's office healed. Because now he had a proof from the Lord, the biggest of them all. And he even had a proof from the doctor that he was not sick. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. You might say, well, but Brother Branham had a lot more. Oh, yeah. We're not going to have any competition between any people. If you pray for one person in your life that the Lord called on you to do, you have done your job. So don't worry about if you didn't pray for a hundred or a thousand or whatever. Just be a polite, simple brother and sister, right? Remember, the gifts in operation are going not according to the gender of a person. All the gifts of the Spirit is filled within every soul. Isn't that wonderful? So that means that women, sisters, they have the same gift that God can inspire. Yeah. 
Remember, if you go around and say, I got a gift, hallelujah, or something like that, uh, the Lord may never use you, right? Because he don't want you to become a boss, a chief captain, or anything like that. But if you can stay little in yourself, nothing in yourself, then God may use you for something. Notice Jesus Christ. He came up and he saw a man, and the man didn't know him because he was blind and couldn't see. John chapter 9. And Jesus looked at him and he said, do you want to see? And he said, yes, I want to see. But how can I? And he said, go and wash in the pool. And the man, he started trying to find the pool and he started washing his eyes and suddenly he could see he was healed but he didn't know who it was Jesus did not tell him remember now when you get your sight back it was Jesus Christ who did it right that is really our desire if something magnificent happens, it was the Baptist church, it was the Pentecostal church, it was this and it was that big man. Hey, that's why the Lord could not do many great miracles in some areas. Because the people were putting up the flesh of a person and he didn't want that. Even when he raised up the dead, Jairus' daughter, you read that little story, and when he woke her up, and she was 12 years old, and the parents were standing there paralyzed, and said, my Lord, my child, my child is alive. And Jesus said, don't tell anyone. How would that be possible? They had already a great company outside, already knowing that if she was dead. So, but Jesus' way of uh, habit, the way he worked, he never really wanted recognition. He wanted the spirit of the Father to move. And he, remember, Jesus never really claimed to be the healer. But he said, I do what my Father tells me to do. And that is the secret that I believe the body of Christ in this late hour. We have had Brother Branham on the scene for, for more than 50 years ago, and he was really a great example. Many people try to copy him. Some people, they feel they have the power in the right hand, so they touch them. Hey, they may have that, I don't know. But uh, they, they try to copy the original and don't stop them let them do whatever they feel for right remember Paul said one day some preach Christ for envy right. for personal reasons and some do it polite because they're led by Christ to do it and he said I praise the Lord anyway Christ, Christ is preached right so therefore don't attack people if you feel they're wrong or something like that. If they come to you and ask if uh, you feel they're right and they have time to sit down with you, you can tell them some uh, secrets of the scriptures and the spirit. Maybe they will understand what is going on in their lives so that they can be a more polite minister so they can uh, be a greater help for the people. All right. <coughs> so therefore, when we read about the stories of the wonderful healings, then we know God is capable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a very popular statement, but it is a true statement. And therefore, even today, if you're here and you're sick, God has the same power today to heal. There's no doubt about it. But when it comes to the question, am I healed? 
then I have always felt I will not pronounce anyone delivered unless the Lord speaks to me. Amen. Like he did to David. Uh, I mean, not Matthew Cox. And he said, you are not sick. And that's a tough statement for one that have felt sick for so many years. And he got released. I'm thankful for that. Not many times have that happened. All right? And when I was talking to about my sister in the back here, she said uh, when she came for prayer, she felt that she was exposed all the time. Almost like we knew what she was doing, what her problem was. Hey, I don't know any problems people have, but God knows it. What we do, we close our eyes to the world, to the five senses. We lay hands on people, and we pray and see God in the Spirit. And whatever He brings to us, we speak to the people. And then, whatever it is, you take it and you will be helped. I believe that. One time I was just, I was ready to go to church, home in Verdal on a Wednesday night. And the telephone called and there was a sister from the western part of, the, of Norway. And she said, I have a son. And the doctors have proclaimed him not healable. He was going to die. He had spinal meningitis. And he was in the last stage. So he, the, he called the family and said, there's nothing we can do. So uh, we just want to tell you so that it doesn't come as a shock when he dies. But she was the grandmother of that five-year-old boy. And she said, is there any possibility for you to pray for him? You don't need to come here. Just pray for him where you are. I said, I'm on my way to church now. So uh, we're going to take him up in prayer right there among the believers. And so we did. We prayed for the little five-year-old with a spinal meningitis. And we, we didn't know anymore then. Was it later that night or was it the next day? The sister called again and she said, when you had had your service, because she knew the service time that we had, and she said, the doctor came running out surprisingly and said, something is happening to the boy. He is restoring. He is going to live. And the grandmother, she was there as a hallelujah. We got someone that are praying, and it works even today. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I'm happy. But it wasn't me. I was too far away. But it is the Lord. If we get together, if we gather our thoughts, we gather our faith in the Lord together, then something can happen. Amen. And deliverance will be there. So we're thankful for that. Uh, so, <clears throat> and that boy, he lived up. He's probably still alive today. I don't call and run down and check on them. Uh, I leave that in the hands of the Lord because he's the healer anyway. He's a better keeper than anyone else. <laughs> so here, when we are gathered together in that sweet spirit, then anything can happen. Amen. Your life may be exposed or when we preach, your answer may be, uh, your questions may be answered. You may never have told the question to anyone, but the Lord, he leads the message in a certain direction to help people to understand that there is hope. And I think that this morning, when we preached on the judgment of uh, Revelation 20, verse 11, I think that is a surprise for many people. It really, in the beginning, it started surprising me also. But I feel that the Lord showed me something, that the first three resurrections, the, the first three parts of the first resurrection, 
is really dedicated to people that have lived for the Lord and the Lord are going to put them in charge when the day comes. So they are people who is going to be ruler and reigners in the millennium kingdom. Yeah. So you have the Old Testament saints. Okay, they're going to have a position. Peter, James, and John already got their position. Jesus told them, in the age of regeneration, there's going to be 12 thrones in Israel, and you are going to sit on them, and you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, that's what Jesus told his own disciples. And of course, you don't need to travel to Jerusalem because you're going to be in the hierarchy of judgment, kings and potentates in, in that millennium kingdom in Jerusalem. Hey, you have your own country. We have our own countries. I told the people in the Philippines, if you want to rule and reign over seven million people in Israel, suit yourself. But you have 105 million people in your own country. I think you have a greater job to be where you are. You say, where you are born, where you are raised, don't you think that the Lord has a purpose? You might say, but what about the children in Africa or the people in Africa? They live in poverty. And when the Lord comes and he's going to start the Millennium Kingdom, what are they going to have? Well, remember, you're not going to have demo, uh, dominion over Mercedes-Benz, right? Over Rolls-Royce, over Lexus. That's, hey, it is people. Right? What they have is minor. If they live in a castle or they live in a small place, that has nothing to do with it. And Brother Brandon was beyond the curtain of time. <coughs> you find out that when he spoke to his daughter, that we have already talked about, and he said, is mom here? And she said, yes. You just follow the path up here and you'll get right, right there. And when he came up there, he saw a little cabin. He didn't see a big, magnificent castle. He saw a humble place. And when he came in the door, he saw his chair. Remember when he was very poor, they bought a chair and they paid on it, but they were not able to pay it all. So they came and got the chair from him. So one day he came home, his, his uh, wife had cooked him a nice meal, <coughs> and he wondered, what about this very nice meal? Can we afford this? And then when he walked in the living room, he understood why. The chair was gone. And then his wife said, but remember, no, this chair is going to stay. Huh? And you might say, is the very important man, William Branham, going to stay in a cabin? Hmm? He, may, he needs to be in a royal castle, the White House, or something like that. Hey, don't think in those terms. Remember, your name is very important. And what you do with your name, and that's not, not when you write your name, but what you do with your personality is what God is looking at. Yeah. And then... When he sees your faithfulness, he will put you in a procession, in a position that nobody else knows about. You're going to have a name that nobody else knows. And really, what is that? It is really an office that is secluded for you. So you are working on your salvation here, right now this very day, and the days to come, and you can do your very best. Uh, one brother came up here this morning after church, 
And he said he really loved the message. But there's something that is bugging him. He said, I'll take you to the Lord and pray about it. And when he said that, I sort of knew what the problem was. I believe that the brother had a backpack of history, earlier life, and he, maybe he was worried about that. And then I said to him, remember now, everything that you have done before you come to Jesus Christ will be zeroed, nilled. You'll come to ground zero when you come to Jesus. So if you have things in your life that you're not sure you're, gonna, you're not sure you're going to stay with the, in front of the Lord very happy because you have a history that you really don't like. And when the Lord sees you, he don't count you guilty of the things you have done in the past when you start believing in the Lord. You have a brand new start. Isn't that wonderful? So therefore, you can jump right now and rejoice. If you feel you have had something, judgment is coming, and I don't know if I'm going to be nervous or happy, then you can relax. Because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ takes away all sin. Amen. He redeems you. Your history is gone. And you have a, you're a new creature in Christ. Yeah. And if you wonder about it, let me read a little scripture for you so that you can find out for yourself that we're speaking the, the right thing. I want to go to uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Many times I use Ezekiel because he's a very good man. He had a wonderful message. He was spoken against. People didn't believe him. But he stayed faithful with what the Lord had showed him anyway. So he, he didn't care about that part. He only wanted to be honest with the Lord. Ezekiel 33. And we want to go to maybe verse 11, 12. I can look up <clears throat> if I get it. Yeah, I'll start with verse 12 so that you can see for yourself. And maybe they'll put it up for you here if you don't have your Bible with you. And those son of man say to the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. So that tells me if you're a good person, but you turn out to be a bad one, then watch out. Remember, your former life, if you start turning around and you become an evil person, hey, none of your good stuff will be remembered. Okay. <clears throat> and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Mm. Here we got the positive part. Neither shall he that is righteous be able to live thereby in the day that is sin. And when I say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trust to his righteousness and commit iniquity, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But his uh, iniquity that he hath committed Therein shall he die, my Lord. And when you say to the wicked, thou shall surely die, and if he then turns from his sin and do which is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, give again which he had taken by robbery, walking in the statues of life, committing no iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Hey, this is Ezekiel. And he says, your state as a person depends on what you are right now. 
I, I, I believe, <coughs> excuse me, that you are not planning to leave the Lord, right? The last part of your life, I've lived for the Lord 50 years. Why should I turn away now and go a different road? Now, I love the Lord and I want to continue. I want to stay humble. Hey, whatever happens to me, I say, Lord, you taketh, you giveth, and your name shall be praised. The book of Job. <laughs> yeah, so, I really have no plans of turning my life around to be a person that's going to be opposing the will of the Lord. And I don't think that anyone here has the same plan to oppose the Lord. You have come here because you love the Lord, you want to do what's right, and you just want to come here for some confirmation, or that you can be able to uh, grow in the Lord, know more about the scriptures, so that you become more settled in your daily activity for the Lord. And uh, I think that we, this weekend, have shared a few, uh, brought a few glimpses into the time of judgment that really should help us and bring joy into our lives. There were things that I really never mentioned uh, this morning because, uh, well, we didn't have time, and some people told me I preached for two hours. Uh, I, don't, I don't recall that, that I did preach that long. But if you say so, you, I probably did. But I'll try to be very quick and short tonight then. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <coughs> All right. When the Lord is bringing us together and we're talking about the judgment, we have looked at Revelation 20, verse 11, and found out that there are people that are going to be judged and measured by the book of life. And to me, when I read that part, I feel if the book of life it is out there, there must be because there's someone that is in the book. And no one's going to be cast into the lake of fire if they're written in the book. We have, I, I spoke about Matthew, Mark, and Luke on Jesus, that he took the small children and blessed them and said that they belong to the kingdom of heaven and they belong to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of heaven is a dispensation of time and the kingdom of God is really God speaking to their heart. Hallelujah. Okay, so, uh, and, and some people may wonder, when are the small ones going to have eternal life? Well, we know a person that dies does not necessarily have eternal life. He needs to be born again for that. But everybody in the Old Testament that believed in the coming Christ, when he paid the price, and uh, the believers that really stood for Christ. Remember, they never knew the name Jesus, but they stood for the anointing that God had in that particular timing and area. They were overclouded with eternal life when they died. Remember, if I remember right, in Revelation chapter 7, there were people there under the altar, and wasn't they given a white robe? Hmm? If you read it right, yeah, they were given a white robe. What does a white robe indicate? Eternal life. So they were asking, Lord, shall you not come and repay what they have done to us? And the Lord said, be still, wait a little, till the rest of your brethren that are going to be killed, that number shall be full. 
Then time will come for payday. And they were given a white robe as a declaration that they have life eternal. Right? Ah. The bride is dressed in fine white linen or in a garment that is a little better clothing, but it is also a garment that indicates she has been very particular about the spirit of the Lord, the word, and she don't compromise on the word. Whenever it is revealed to her, she will follow it. So that's why it become a white garment, a fine linen. Remember, if you found a beautiful girl and she became your fiance, and then you find out that she's messing around, you might say, no, it's not going to be a white cloth on you <laughs> because you are not a clean person. And they break up the fellowship and they separate, right? Because we need to be faithful to each other. And when we start to walk with the Lord, we need to be faithful to him. So therefore, whatever revelation he puts in your heart, that is your responsibility. Whether there are people in Russia that never have heard the gospel, and you, and you can hear a message like this and say, oh my, and they're going to be saved too. And they haven't even fought a battle like me. Hey, don't worry about that. We always have a tendency to measure others' lives with our own. And we think that we pay a higher price. But we really don't know. But pay the price the Lord put upon you so that you are that tool in his hand so he can look at the devil like he did with Job. And he said, that's my servant. And he is not going to give up. And the devil might say, let me have him. And the Lord looks at him and he said, well, maybe devil, you need a little lesson. So I'll let you have him for a short while. But you cannot take his life. And here, your trouble starts. Anyone had troubles lately? <laughs> well, you know yourself, right? But remember, no, all the troubles you face is always watched by God's all-seeing eyes. And he will never let anything come upon you that you're not built to take. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Hey, I have gone through some sifts in life, and people didn't like me, but I really didn't worry too much about it, because I found out that the Lord likes me. And then I let the people say, well, I don't try to live so that they will dislike me. I, I will try my best to have a polite way of behavior, but for some people that don't work, because they say, oh, he's a sneaky fellow, he is... He is humble, but underneath the skirt, or the shirt, is, and, and, sorry about that. I said that in faith assembly, rolling up the skirt, I said, and I did like this. And the people started laughing, because skirt is something else, right? But in Norwegian, we have different words and terminologies. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so therefore, when the Lord comes to us and helps us, then he will also give us the power and the means to overcome the wicked one. I'm so happy for that. So if you are here and you are under severe problems and you don't know how you will survive, remember, God has seen you all the time. And there is not a day in your life that is not in God's logbook. Yeah. And if you, if you take it, in a wonderful, positive way, maybe your testings will be shortened. You see, sometimes we are aggravated. And then, hey, have you ever had a problem and you bypass the problem? And then after a few days or weeks, same problems come up again. And you say, why? And you bypass it again. Because you think 
by bypassing it, don't dealing with it, you're going to be okay. But the third time you see the same problem coming up, maybe it's time to make, take a look and say, hmm, maybe I should go into the problem, ask the Lord for leading, so that I can go through it. And then when you go through it, it will never come back again. You won the prize. Because the Lord has put you on a testing ground. He is educating you for the wonderful kingdom to come. Hallelujah. There is a fifth kingdom coming. According to Daniel chapter 2. There are four kingdoms that have already been here. The Babylonian, the Persian, the Greece and the Roman. And remember, even if the Muslim world, the Chinese world the Russian communism, or whatever. Remember, Brother Branham said it back in his day when communism was very strong. He said, don't look at these things. Fix your eyes on Catholicism. That is the real danger. Amen. So all the others, Muslims, Chinese, Russians, Nazism, all them tendencies, of course, they come up and they, they hurt some people, but they are not there to be able to take control over the world. God will see fit to put them under such pressure that they cannot take control. Praise the Lord. So if you think that the Muslims are going to take over America, think twice. That's not going to happen. And he say, but what if they do? Well, maybe they can take a city or two, or I don't know. But the Lord said, it is not the Muslim world, it is the Catholic, uh, Catholic world that is the real danger. Because out of Catholicism, the Antichrist will come, and he will be the false prophet, which the Lord Jesus Christ will take in his day, at the end of Revelation chapter 19, he will take that false prophet and he will throw him alive in the lake of fire. Together with the beast. Because the beast is the angelic system that have ruled over the Middle East from the days of Babylon and up till that time. Oh Lord, he knows what he's doing. So be at peace, be happy in the Lord. And if you feel there are some threatening things coming your way, just get closer to God. He has a way out of it. Uh, and if you don't think you have, then think about Jesus Christ. Born in Bethlehem, living in Bethlehem for about two years, right? And then comes the wise men from the Far East. And they come to Herod. And they start talking about where is the Messiah? Where is the king that is born? And the king hadn't even heard about it. So he went to the scribes and the Pharisees and he said, what is it that I hear that there is a Christ coming? There is a Messiah. And they started going in the scriptures and they found out that it says, O Bethlehem, out of thee shall a king's scepter come. And when Herod heard that, he told the wise men, I think you're talking about Bethlehem. So he told them, and when you see that, that king, please come and tell me, so I can come and worship too. But he, of course, was not coming to worship. He was coming to kill. So they met Jesus. They gave silver. They gave mirror. They gave the Fran Frankenstein, I think it was called. Yeah. And they left because the Lord revealed in a dream to them, don't go back to the king. <coughs> and in the middle of the night, the Lord woke Joseph up. Amen. And he said, Herod is planning a plot. He's going to kill every child in Bethlehem. Get up. Get out of the city now. <laughs> oh, I like that. Hey, sometimes... Your adversaries, your enemies, they're so close, but they're not close enough. If the Lord had given you more days, 
If you're going to do or fulfill something, he's going to make sure that you have a dream or that you have a message from the Lord or that you hear something from heaven so that you can escape and continue the work that, is up, that you are up to do. Mm, that's, that's a wonderful thing. So why should we be nervous? Nervous about crime. We passed the city of Gary, the, the highest crime in America, right? We, we still pass and smile, right? Because uh, they never came and stopped us. <laughs> okay, and probably if you live close to Gary, you may have never been stopped. They have never been hostile to you. But still, it is a town that people say they're scared when they go in there. Well, you just don't go in there on, at midnight, right? <laughs> okay, so I hope that I said what I was thinking of Ezekiel chapter 33, that a person that turns to the Lord, if you're 50, 60, 70 years old, and you turn to him, the Lord will erase your history under the blood of Jesus Christ, you will become a new person in the Lord. But don't use that as an excuse. But use it as a time given to you by the Lord. Because you lived a rotten life. Remember Paul, when he was uh, expressing himself, he said, sometimes I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle because I have persecuted the church. But he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So Paul was very much aware of his history, but he did not let it make him afraid so that he wouldn't serve the Lord anymore. I, I even remember he said, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. Yeah, and that was not just a woe because I'm going to be after you, and if you don't preach the gospel, I remember everything you've done. I'm going to be after you. No. When the Lord came and cleansed him, he was clean. But when he says, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel, that is more a vocation on his own life. Because I want to preach the gospel. I want to be a servant. I like to stay faithful to the Lord the rest of my life. So therefore, if you have any of those categories in your life, don't go around being mis miserable. Just be happy in the Lord that the blood has covered all you have done in your life. But just make sure now that you don't repeat what happened before. Now you are a humble being serving the Lord with gladness and joy. Uh, there were something, uh, when I finished this morning, I kind of said that I'm probably done with my message, but I wasn't quite fully done. As you can probably hear. But when I, when I look at, because there are a lot of questions that comes up. In, uh, in Wordal, Norway, we, uh, we have the Stöfferingshaug family. Luna is a daughter there. And the family is a caring family. And if they see something that needs to be done, they're quite active to do what they feel is right. And there was a little boy that was born. But he had deficiencies on his body. He was blind. He could not hear. He was deaf. He had no speech. They could not communicate with him. So they had to turn, they had to learn him some uh, finger operations on, in his hand to make him understand or that he could tell them what he needed. Well, if you, if you pull on the little finger and you need to be at the bathroom, that's a good thing that you, you have a little communication. Yeah. 
<laughs> or else you're going to be watching diapers for all the years coming. So therefore they trained the boy. Of course the parents trained the boy. But Maria and Mette and Luna, they took part in child caring for the little boy. And I thought that was a very nice gesture that they did that. Because that boy, he would never be able to hear or understand the gospel. Right? He, hey, I, I believe that he had a good sense. But when you don't hear anything, you don't understand what's going on. He died when he was 16, 17 years old. And probably never had a gospel training in his life. Hey, there were people, Christian people, caring for him. Telling him what's right by pulling hand or whatever, right? And then he died. Then after he died, his mother, she wrote a little article in the newspaper. And she said something to this. This is not uh, word by word, but as I remember it, he said, I got a little package from heaven. Yeah. And I was asked if I could tear, take care of this package till delivery time came in. And they didn't know how many months, years it was going to be. And the mother and the father, they made a commitment. We're going to take care of him. We're not going to put him in a hospital. Because in a hospital, he would just be a number. They, hey, remember, people in hospitals, they cannot care for them as a parent can do. Because it's a special bond with parentship. So for 16 years, they took part in caring for the little boy. And then he dies. Where does he go? Where is he now? What in your mind are, are you thinking? Hmm? We have hundreds of uh, situations. Maybe you, that you have lost a baby, lost a young one. I hope that you still remember the little uh, session about Brother Branham's daughter dying only eight months old, waking up and he sees her a few weeks later and she is 18 to 20 years old and she's, she's capable of speaking and saying, hi dad, knowing who her daddy is. So where was he when he saw her? Of course, she was in a dimension, in a heavenly dimension. The Lord said, I, in my father's house, there are many dimensions. So therefore, God knows how to put people in the right type of dimension. And I'm not going to, to part it up in six, seven, eight, nine, ten dimensions. And what is the poorest and what is the best. Right? We'll leave that to him. <coughs> but here is a boy that lived to be 16 years. He has passed what we call the age of accountability. But I don't believe that he has been able to express anything that was of the nature of the spirit. Remember now, God can speak to people that you look upon as dumb, like they are a, they're, they're a vegetable. But if you are able to look into the sixth sense, the other dimension, there might be that the Lord is speaking to them. But you and I, we don't know what's going on. We have to leave it alone. You have another couple that we know very well. It is uh, Brother Blake. Sister Glenda, they got very much in love, got married, and they got a little boy. But when he was born, 
he ended up having cerebral palsy, whatever you call it. And that boy is no more than 30 years old. And he don't have a language. He is bound to a wheelchair the rest of his life, unless the Lord comes and deliver him. Of course he can do that. The Lord waited 38 years to heal the blind man from his blindness in John chapter 9. So therefore, it tells us God has a plan for everything. But if a person does not recover and he dies, if he dies at 40 or 50 years old, where, where does he go? When I was a little boy, about six, seven years old, my parents took me to a relative's home in another part in a farmland. <coughs> And by the window, when we came there to visit, there was a man standing by the window, and he was uh, drawling. So you could see the drawling down his face on his shirt, and he was like this. Uh, uh, uh. I got so scared. My Lord, uh, that's a dangerous man. Well, he wasn't dangerous. He was just out of his mind. He'd never had a normal day in his life from his birth. And now he was a big adult. Oh, a big fellow. But I was scared, I can tell you. But later on, in 1974, I think it was, I, I was called in back to the army again because you do some repeat work in the army. But I denied it. I told the captain of the army, there's too much drunk people in your army. I don't want to go back in there. <laughs> he, he didn't like that. <coughs> but I could say what was honest. Them captains and lieutenants, they were drank, drunk almost every day when I served the 12 months in the army. So, uh, and I didn't want to go back there. So they sent me to a hospital where the people were uh, disabled. And then, when I was looking at the list over the patients, I found the name of the man that I was, I was so scared about when I was a little boy. Now, he was shipped over to this hospital, and he's living there till his dying day. So I walked over to, to that section. I talked if I could come in and see the man. They said, yes, yes, you're working here. Of course you can come in. But it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, but we're really sorry to tell you, he's already in bed now. And we have already doped him down, the pills, you know, because they don't want much activity when they uh, are going to bed. But I walked in that room, and the same man was there, had no way of expression at all. And I was thinking, Lord, what about him? He never had a normal day in his life. And now he's in a hospital really to die. He might not die the first 10 years. But he will never get out of there. So what about him? Well, the Lord didn't speak audibly. But uh, I started thinking, what about them who doesn't have a normal upbringing? They have deficiencies in their bodies. They cannot defend themselves. They need protection from others. And sometimes even others need protections from them. Because they might not understand them and they might attack you. Right? But they don't attack you out of evilness. Just out of defense. And when I look at the scriptures here, in Revelation 20 verse 11... I see people that never had a chance to live a normal life. They're going to be put in that section. Because God is merciful. He don't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to make it, if possible. But if they don't have a mind to think right, if they don't have a body to express themselves, 
their five senses. It is out of reach. You cannot really touch them, talk to them. And of course, the nurses, they might not always treat them good. So they might have a painful life even. Well, we don't know that. But in some hospitals, uh, some people, they have lived so long with patients that they have become numb to a caring desire. But I hope that people that don't really care, that they can find another job. <laughs> <coughs> All right. So here you see people. I have mentioned a few uh, incidences out of my own personal life. What I see and what I feel when I see those things. And I will say, such a person, if God puts him in hell, I don't believe he will. Because they never had a chance to express themselves. Their conscience, we don't know what they're thinking, but that is what the Lord knows. But as an average thought about people that are disabled, people that have defensive, uh, defense, uh, defenses, people that are uh, sick for some reason that they cannot function and communicate, when they die, hey, the Lord knows them. And he has a book of life for every person that have lived on earth. If he can take a person that had lived eight months and put them in heaven and give them a body and give them a, an ability to talk back to their father when he comes, I believe that he can do that to anyone. And you might say, well, that's only because it was Brother Branham. I don't believe so. Brother Branham was a rascal himself. He didn't have a very popular life when he started out. And I'm not saying before the Lord, but he was a kind of a wild guy. Well, the only thing that he couldn't do was smoking and drinking. The Lord saw to that. But he was a boxer, so he had some fights. All right? And sometimes he even shot at people to kill them. He was so mad at them. But every time he shot, it clicked. It never, the bullet never worked. I think that was God's grace too. Or else he would have been in prison for the rest of his life. So here we have a man that really didn't have the best starting ground. But the Lord came with his grace and mercy and turned him around and made him to the best vessel that you can ever think of on this earth in this century. Hallelujah. So therefore, uh, I may just repeat this so that you will remember it. The first resurrection is really for people that have proved something with their spiritual life. And the Lord is acknowledging their lives so that they will come up and they will be judged by what they done, or should we say, they will be judged by how they responded to spiritual advice, spiritual inspiration. Yeah. That's probably the best way to say it. And the rest of the people who dies then, remember no, I'm not here to throw people in hell. Right? I'm trying here to, to throw people in heaven. <laughs> and I know that I cannot put everyone in heaven. <coughs> but I want you to think in a little different terminology of how you look at people. When you come into a hospital and you see people and they lay in bed and say, ah, ah, ah. And you might say, oh, silly, right? That's your first thought. And some of them, they do that for years. My, uh, my mother-in-law, she ended up in a hospital. 
She was 86 years when she died, but she could not take care of herself anymore, and we lived about a thousand kilometers away. So she ended up in a hospital. And when we came to visit, there was a lady there, and she was going, Otto! 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 That was her husband. He'd been mad, dead for many years. But he, she was crying out, Otto. And they could not keep her silent. Maybe they should have put her in the room, but she was among the, all the others. And the people were kind of irritated. He's, he's calling on Otto. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, I've seen it. There's so many things going on. But when they are senile, remember behind the senile mind, there is really a mind that is up and going. I look at senility as a, should I say, a broken connection between your five senses and your soul. So whatever you think of, whatever you are wanting to express, when it comes out, it comes out wrong. They don't know what they're saying. Maybe they don't even hear themselves. And they don't know how to express it the right way. Therefore, people with senility, hey, there are Christian people that are senile, right? Yeah. And of course, there are worldly people. But I say, don't look at them and say, you're going to hell. There's no hope for that one. Their mind is gone. Remember, when they die, their mind is going to be right. And they're going to have a spirit where their soul can communicate again. So if you meet that senile person in heaven, they might see, say to you, hi, brother. And you say, ah, they're speaking. <laughs> because now the connection is repaired. <laughs> What is going to happen from now till the coming of the Lord? Remember, sickness is increasing <coughs> rapidly. We have more remedies, we have more medicine than ever, but we also have more sick people than ever. So it looks like it goes in a, <laughs> a certain trend. The more things we can repair, the next one, the next thing, the Lord is there to help so that we don't lose out on our mind. So I pray that we will be able to see that part. So I ended up saying a little more about Revelation 20.11 because I see a part here where people, even if they're 50, 60, 70 years old, and they never had a chance to express themselves, God will be their protector so that they will be in the eternal state when time comes. So therefore, I hope that you will look at sick, senile, children with defi uh, deficits, uh, children that cannot have a communication, some that dies too young, then, Maybe this could be a peace of mind to you that remember, they are in a better place. And I think I mentioned Brother Julius Stotzkler, <coughs> so I don't need to repeat that. The Lord even sees up the road what would happen to us if he don't take us at the appointed time. So where there is an appointed time from the Lord to go, it is better to go now. And then you will be home with him and you will enjoy the eternal bliss when that time comes. You will be in a state in heaven, paradise. You will enjoy it. And I believe you will never want to go back again. That is really what I see in it. Are you still happy? Amen. All right. I don't think I want to push any further. I have another other message on my mind. 
but uh, we'll wait till Wednesday. We have another service on Wednesday. Amen. So if you're real hungry and curious, just be back. And we will see what we can say in the days to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, do you love the Lord? Amen. Do you think what I'm saying makes sense scripturally? Hey, you think about it. Pray with me about it. Because it might be an unusual thought in, so, in that way. But when I, when I see the people that have never been able to express anything in their life or through their life, then God will give them the chance to walk with him in the eternal bliss. And we will be together with them. But that is after the millennium is over. May God bless you tonight. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for his uh, saving grace that he touched me. And I'm thankful that he's touching you. May he do a mighty good work in your life so you can be a good representation of the kingdom of God. All right, Brother Tim, God bless you. Amen. <clears throat> As we know, have been finishing the preaching part. We will take this prayer cloth, right? It's not going to cut down on your singing. <laughs> you can sing as long as you want after this. Praise the Lord. We anoint this with oil, as it is said in the scriptures. And we pray that the one 